With me today is Richard J. Estes, a preeminent well-being researcher. Richard, can you tell us your current title and uh, institutional affiliation? Yes, I'm professor of uh, social policy and practice with the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh, my area of specialization is international development, where I deal primarily with a broad range of social, political, and economic forces that uh, influence the uh, development of countries, particularly poorer countries, in their relationships with uh, wealthier countries. Very good. Um, Richard, what do you see as your main contributions to the field of well-being? Um, from the beginning, I, I've done a lot of the pioneering work in terms of objective approaches to uh, quality of life research. My interest has been to identify the major barriers that prevent people from achieving um, the goals of uh, life satisfaction, promoting their overall quality of life, and more fundamentally, of course, advancing their sense of well-being. So that uh, my interest is dealing with uh, reducing rates of infant mortality, advancing uh, uh, programs and services for highly vulnerable population groups, um, reducing income disparities between the very rich and the very poor. Uh, in other words, dealing with um, those within all societies that uh, don't share equally in the full benefits that are available in the society. And that, that really is the consistent theme on which I've worked. And there are a lot of variations to, mm -hmm. to that, but uh, that really is the, the core of uh, what I'm concerned with. Can you tell us about um, some of the major projects you've been involved with that you're uh, particularly well, proud of or happy about? Uh, well, there are a number. Uh, I could, the biggest project that I completed uh, a few years ago was with the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, where I developed for the UN uh, the plan for reducing poverty for the entire region. Wow. That region is 70% of the world's population. Oh, my gosh. And includes China and India. And we worked on that for three years. Hmm with uh, representatives from uh, all 54 member states mm -hmm. of the UN in, in that region um, and came up with a very successful plan which resulted subsequently in the uh, creation of the Millennium Development Goals mm -hmm. that came uh, directly from uh, the work that we accomplished in uh, Asia and the Pacific. So that, that's a project that I feel very satisfied with. but. There are so many areas in which I'm engaged that I, I feel happy with. At the moment, I'm dealing with uh, issues of the Middle East, um, with the um, high levels of disease between the West and the East, particularly with the, the Middle East. Um, I really feel it's important for me to put attention to try and better understand the issues that are occurring uh, in that region of the world. So uh, a colleague, Habib Talon, who you were scheduled to interview, uh, and I have just published an article which will appear in Social Indicators Research, which is a comprehensive assessment of the state of well-being mm -hmm. in uh, the Middle Eastern countries. And Joe Sergi, another of our colleagues, and I um, just published uh, a very interesting uh, article, again in Social Indicators Research, on uh, Islamic terrorism and ways for reducing um, Islamic uh, terrorism on the part of the West and looking specifically at examining the social and structural inequalities that exist between the various societies that promote and sustain the high level of tension uh, between Can you tell us more? Can you tell us more about those inequalities as you identify well, them? Well, the major issue is uh, the history of colonialism. Mm -hmm. When uh, European powers, the French, the, the British, the, the Dutch, the Belgians, and others mm -hmm. occupied mm -hmm. uh, large areas of uh, Arabic uh, lands, I should say Muslim lands because they're not all Arabic mm -hmm. uh, lands, but Muslim lands, and, and basically plundered the resources 
of the region for the benefit of the colonizing power mm -hmm. primarily mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the majority of uh, the population received very, very uh, little out of that. Uh, now, uh, what the countries are dealing with is the problems of post-colonization -colon mm -hmm. and trying to create new political systems, new approaches to education, even new ways of thinking um, that were not possible while they were being uh, occupied, essentially. The, the concept of um, the third world in a psychological sense rather than in a socioeconomic sense is very real hmm. in the Middle East because you have um, people who uh, are basically Arabic, who grew up under French colonial uh, power, mm -hmm. identified themselves as French in order to be close to the advantaged, privileged, powerful group. Mm -hmm. And now that that group is gone, uh, they're, they're kind of an admixture of uh, the two groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the search to find and re find a new identity mm -hmm. for themselves that builds on the best of what occurred during the colonial period, but more importantly on their long and rich legacy. Um, of their own people. They, of their own people. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really uh, quite a struggle. Plus, these are all very successful countries from a development point of view. People are living almost as long as those in economically advanced countries. Interesting. The problem is fertility rates continue to be very high. Mm -hmm. Aging mm -hmm. is increasing very mm -hmm. rapidly. So you have this very peculiar problem of societies that are growing in numbers where half of the population is 18 years of age and under. Oh my gosh. And so you just do the mathematics about how many adults are available to care for young people. Mm -hmm. And of course, the job opportunities that would be available for so many people entering the market, mm -hmm. even with advanced degrees, um, it raises uh, quite a number of challenges for those societies. Um, any other projects that you've uh devoted your career to that you'd like to tell us about and some of the interesting findings? Well, the, the major work in which I've been engaged has, has been uh, every five years doing an analysis of the world social situation. Uh, I've developed a very extensive database in which I follow 160 countries wow. in terms of their overall socioeconomic development in 10 quite different sectors of uh, development. And that database is now 40 years old, so that I have very rich time series data covering uh, that full uh, space of time. This is a very unique data set. Well, it's all, it seems to cover the whole world almost. I mean, aren't there about 190 it's countries It's 95% or so? of the world's population. That's amazing. How did you ever uh, get into this? How did you ever develop this idea and the measures? Actually, uh, I was invited to take on the task originally by the Secretary General of an international organization, again on behalf of the United Nations. The 1960s was the period of the first developmental decade of the UN, and everybody recognized that uh, the developmental decade, the first developmental decade, did not succeed. Mm -hmm. In fact, it failed because its goals were purely economic. Mm. The assumption was that if people had more money in the economy and on a per capita basis, that all kinds of other social gains would be uh, realized. Mm -hmm. Didn't occur. Didn't occur at all. And in fact, uh, the countries were quite miserable. Uh, it turned out there was no relationship between increases in per capita income and gains in Very social interesting. development. And we have it in uh, economically advanced countries also, uh, mm -hmm. countries like the United States. Mm -hmm. um, this is a society that uh, has more wealth than any other nation on the planet on a per capita basis, mm -hmm. and yet we still have 50 plus million people who live in poverty. Um, 
it's absolutely unbelievable. One out of five children in the United States are officially classified as poor. This despite the fact that we have as much uh, wealth as we do, we do. So we see the situation in poor developing countries and it's mirrored, echoed in uh, rich countries very much. And this has to do with the structural inequalities that exist in the way in which societies have organized themselves to, to benefit a relatively small number of people. Can we say that this, and this has been the thrust of your career to this, document this and address that, this? That's correct. That, uh -huh. That's been the major preoccupation that, that I've had. And I've looked at it in relation to particular population groups, uh, women, ethnic minorities, religious minorities. Uh, different regions of the world and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so th this really has been a, a major focus of, uh, of my work. Can you tell us about uh, some of the, the findings from these different groups uh, or some of the results that, uh, that you found? Is there anything else you'd like to highlight in terms of what you've seen in particular groups well, in terms there, of structural inequality? There ha has been a lot of progress for selected individuals in the groups. But for the groups as a whole, there's been stagnation. Mm. Um, and today, which is uh, 2013, we find the gap between the rich and the poor widening mm -hmm. rather than narrowing. It's actually gotten worse. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that all the poor, all the people classified as poor have always been poor. That's not the case. Many people who were poor rose up out of poverty and have made it according to the dream of mm -hmm. the American dream formula of hard work and opportunity and uh, developing uh, their own businesses and enterprises and so on. They, they've done very, very well. They succeeded. But the group as a whole has not. And um, so rather than narrowing, that gap has continued to widen for them. Unfortunately, today, it's basically people of color. Um, in the United States, it's uh, uh, African Americans primarily, and Mexican Americans, um, and the nearly 12 million uh, illegal, uh, illegal workers in the mm -hmm. United States, none of whom have uh, official papers recognizing the right uh, to be here. Uh, those folks don't stand a chance mm -hmm. of moving up in the opportunity structure. So uh, they constantly are victims of uh, exploitation, economic exploitation, um, because of their um, um, very precarious legal status. So it's, uh, I think it's amazing how this gap has grown in the United States, and many people have talked about it. The uh, um, from you know, Warren Buffett saying he needs to pay more taxes, and uh, the uh, the late philanthropist Bernard Rappaport talked about it too. I want to pay right. more taxes. I need to contribute more. Um, do you have any uh, uh, Do you have any ideas about how to how to change the situation or the practical implications of these findings? Well, certainly, um, more taxes are needed. Public services, public programs are needed to advance the needs of disadvantaged groups, particularly when the, that disadvantaged is being held by uh, very affluent people within society, that is, that, that maintain it, uh, so that you have to have some transfer of wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge is to figure out the appropriate apparatus for doing that. Um, no one wants to develop a welfare system for the poor that rewards poverty, mm -hmm. in a sense. What you want to do is to provide incentives for, for people who are willing to work and can work um, to do so. Mm -hmm. And that will require uh, resources. But a complex problem in this is that um, a large number, a disproportionate number of these populations are children who cannot be expected to reasonably provide for their own mm -hmm. economic needs. Mm -hmm. And another very large share are elderly people mm -hmm. or persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And they simply can't 
uh, solve these problems. Mm -hmm. So there, there has to be new transfers of wealth from all classes of society in order to uh, bring about the kind of social, uh, profound social change that, uh, that I'm referring to, to close that gap. Certainly, if that gap continues to widen, and it's really widening like mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. um, this, this becomes the, the grounds for foundation for at least social chaos mm -hmm. in the future. No society uh, has been able to stand with uh, that, de that degree of disparity uh, within it, that other than authoritarian societies. But no democratic free society has, uh, has been able to withstand um, those, uh, those inequities. Well, it's pretty frightening. And you're saying that uh, when it comes to children and people with disabilities and the, the oh. elderly, um, we can't really expect them to be working um, gainfully employed. And yet they need, uh, they need services they're not getting, they're simply not getting. Right. And when I say elderly, I don't mean all elderly. I mean elderly right. who are unable to provide for themselves. Correct. Many older people are quite able. Yes. You know, they've, they've saved, they've invested, they have adequate resources. Thank you very much. They don't need this kind of assistance. But it's not true for most of the elderly. Uh, most elderly are living on um, Social Security. Mm -hmm dwindling pensions, mm -hmm. actually disappearing pension If any, programs. yes. Uh -huh. And their families are increasingly less able to be of help to them because mm -hmm. their families are under stresses of their own to provide for, uh, for their children and the responsibilities that they have in terms of their families of creation. So it, it's very difficult um, for the family, if you will, to carry the traditional function that families have during periods of economic and social hardship. It just isn't possible. And with the, um, um, have you looked at unemployment too, which is much uh, greater in the United unemployment States? Unemployment is extremely uh, significant. It's high in the United States. Underemployment is a more serious problem than unemployment. You have a lot of people, including university graduates, who are working in positions that really don't require university uh, degrees. But the, the, the problem is not in economically advanced countries, though it is serious in these countries. Mm -hmm. It's really in developing countries where people have gone to university, sometimes even overseas universities, return home in search of jobs, wanting very much to facilitate the development of their societies but finding no jobs, no opportunities to do that. And uh, this, this contributes enormously to the social uh, tensions that exist in these societies. The Arab Spring, for example, mm -hmm. uh, many of the leadership of the Arab Spring are young, were young people aged 25 and younger with university degrees, mm -hmm. simply because uh, they were advocating for dramatic reforms. They, they couldn't uh, possibly achieve them in any other way. Are there any other areas of your, of your work that you'd like to highlight? Any other milestones you can tell us about? Uh, things you're, you're proud of or look back on with satisfaction? Well, I think, I, no, I, I think the, um, the trends in social development at the world level, at the regional level, uh, and even at the national level, I would say would be the, the major contributions that I've made. Um, within uh, my own discipline, which is social work, um, I have another whole body of, uh, of literature, which is, has to do with internationalization of the uh, profession and preparing people as uh, diplomats uh, for assignments overseas. Mm -hmm. And I have a long history of preparing people for that. And Can you tell us about your contributions to well, and, and helping other the schools. profession of social work? Right. Uh, okay. And developing um, uh, international programs and other schools of uh, social work, not only in this country, but in other countries. Um, I frequently go to Asia, uh, to Africa, um, and uh, work with their universities and helping them develop these programs. And the idea is for 
people not necessarily to leave their country of origin, but to use their country of origin as a base of operation for dealing with uh, global affairs. Mm -hmm. And they can deal with it through participation in non-governmental organizations, in national organizations that have an international dimension to them. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a variety of ways of doing that. But many people also pursue genuinely international careers through the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, um, the UN generally, um, have, I have many people who, who are graduates who are part of those systems. Terrific. Um, can you give us an example of a social work program you consulted with where you felt like the results well, were Well, uh, one that, that I developed was um, just a couple of years ago. It was in uh, Mongolia. Huh. This is post-collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh -huh. uh, and Mongolia was, of course, a... Um, not a part of the Soviet Union, but mm -hmm. was uh, a sister state with uh, the Soviet Union, but then became independent. And so uh, I worked with them in helping them transform the old system that they had, which really was not working at all. The, 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 the system simply taught that there were no social problems in societies. Wow. It, it is just completely blind to that fact. Yes, the, the social <laughs> the needs realities. Yeah, are problems of uh, the Western world. So our social system, we can take care of everything. The problem was in the capital city, we had 10,000 kids living under the streets wow. in the pipes. Um, Mongolia is extremely cold. Uh -huh. And um, heat. Uh, for the city is transferred through uh, pipes that run under the uh, streets and children uh, live in uh, in those pipes So our first job was to develop a social work training program that would deal with outreach to those children and to find homes and protective services for them and other kinds of services support services of uh, various types wow and also dealing with uh, child prostitution, which mm -hmm. was uh, very rampant. Hmm. Uh, the commercial sexual exploitation of children has been a big topic of mine also. I have five books on uh, child sexual exploitation. Um, and you've done quite a bit of, uh, besides that scholarship, you've done a lot of advocacy work, have you not? Enormous amount of advocacy work. Any Where project I undertake I undertake scholarship first, research first, mm -hmm. high quality research first. Disseminate that to the appropriate audiences, which will be other scholars and mm -hmm. legislators and so on. Uh, but then the second part of my project life will be advocating mm -hmm. to implement the findings and recommendations that emerge from the research. So for me, I never complete a project and then walk away from it. Yeah. I generate as much knowledge as is possible from the research and then um, continue on with a whole different, in a whole different mode of um, mobilizing communities. And we do it through newspaper um, interviews, television interviews, um, mm -hmm. international congress, uh, con uh, advocacy for promoting uh, new laws, mm -hmm. and we've been very, very successful in, uh, in this area. Well, I'd like to hear, it's a wonderful model of scholarship. Um, before we hear about some of the advocacy efforts, um, any, other er any other areas of uh, scholarship involving this first step of studying the problem uh, that you haven't brought up that you want to discuss today? Any no, other? I, I think that would... Okay, so in terms of practical special. implications, what kind of advocacy efforts have you un have you taken up with related to sexual slavery, let's say? Yes, uh, I would say the major ones have been the passage of federal laws that have uh, made penalties for engaging in uh, sexual slavery, in the commercial sexual exploitation of children, uh, much more serious for offenders. And then uh, not only getting laws passed, but more importantly, laws implemented. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we enforcement. then work with enforcement, because you can get all kinds of laws on the books, mm -hmm. and uh, they really fall into, uh, I wouldn't say disuse, but they're, they're not mm -hmm. used as, as much as uh, they, they could be. 
In our case, we then work with um, non-governmental organizations, local police authorities, mm -hmm. FBI, and uh, we really put the heat on them mm -hmm. to, uh, to do the enforcement. And uh, we've had a lot of uh, situations where large rings of um, sex traffickers mm -hmm. uh, have been arrested, prosecuted, Wow. and of course are imprisoned. We also raised the length of uh, sentences for um, engaging in this kind of activity. The minimum sentence now is 25 years wow. without the possibility of uh, parole. How did you learn about this advocacy? I don't think of this as something that's uh, in a typical social work textbook. Though. No, actually it is. So okay. Advocacy is the bread and butter of social work. Um, Casework, as we think about it, is, is long-standing in terms of the analysis and diagnosis of people need and trying to understand the problems and, you know, providing for their individual needs. But the second part of uh, advocacy is community organization, mm -hmm. social planning, community development, those kinds of things. The, that's the second stream is what I'm closely associated with. Mm -hmm. So I teach strategic planning. I teach generating resources of, in support of uh, organizations, teach planning in general. Um, so that's where the advocacy gets translated into the classroom. And of course, I have an army of students mm -hmm. who work on this uh, with me. Mm -hmm. This is the wonderful thing, as you know, of university life. You inspire others to join with you in undertaking uh, tasks. And how did you how did you begin with uh, changing this federal legislation, for example? Well, we the the first job was to get the feds to um, and states to fund the research. Uh, we had sufficient money from private sources to do the research, but I would not proceed until the federal government bought into the research and provided substantial funding in support of it and committed their agencies, their 14 agencies, that are responsible for different aspects of this commercial sexual exploitation mm -hmm. of children issue. We had all 14 agencies participating in the project with us. Wow. Um, the Postal Service, Customs, FBI, mm -hmm. CIA, all of them, they all worked with us as uh, full partners. Um, and we worked with them in helping to frame the recommendations for action. Once they worked with us in helping to frame the recommendations for action, that became real for them. That became their, their uh, focal point for what it is that they needed to do to move forward. Very clever. So you get them involved and you get their input and it becomes their project. And they're yeah. invested in it even after you I, may leave the scene. It's not my problem. Mm -hmm. It's our problem. A collective problem mm -hmm. and what one needs to do is to bring to the table all of the elements that are responsible for solving the problem some of it private some some of them uh, public and so we've been very successful and a bit clever in how we've been able to bring together the private public uh, partnerships in promoting resolution of, uh, of these issues well, it's amazing. And we, yeah. we, it really has been a very successful uh, initiative. Now it's 15 years. Well, you seem to be an organizational mastermind to keep track of all that. It's it, amazing. It's quite a lot to, to do. But um, the energy comes from the people you're serving. Um, the project is not uh, abstract. Mm -hmm. They're real people. All mm -hmm. you have to do is to meet with a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, that gives me the energy to go uh, forward in terms of uh, what it is that I need to do. The same thing with uh, the international work, um, working with uh, disadvantaged people who are trapped in situations that they cannot possibly extricate themselves from without some realignment of the social system. Uh, that provides the energy we're bringing about change. So you've never done a pure data collection project where you're completely removed from the people. No. You always you meet no. them, 
you see no. the situation nationally or internationally? No, I, uh, I, I would, you would call me an applied social scientist. Uh -huh. That uh, my practice is really the advocacy and the action. But uh, my commitment is to action with knowledge because I have a strong belief that um, knowledge without action is immoral. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, Great lesson for academics. I, I think it's a very important lesson. And um, to have knowledge and no action is absolutely corrupt. Really is. Um, so ma many people study problems and then just go on to the next paper or project. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us um, any other practical implications of your work and career that you'd like to share at this point? Well, I think um, passing on, I'm 71 now, and um, about to retire from the university. Um, the goal at 71 is to pass on what you've learned and to ensure that um, You've institutionalized through other people mm -hmm. uh, some of the zeal and some of the spirit and the commitments and values that uh, that one has, even though the way that people put it together will be different to reflect their unique approach mm -hmm. to things. Mm -hmm. And I feel very successful with that. People um, who are deeply committed to these issues and pursue them in very very different ways. And many of these you've mentored or inspired. It must be oh, very absolutely. satisfying. Absolutely. Do you have any idea, any further ideas for ways to keep the field vibrant and growing? That is the field of well-being in general. Well, uh, I think we're making so much progress in the field of well-being in general. Uh, psychologically, the sense of well-being among people worldwide is on the rise. I mean, obviously it's higher in some places and lower in others and sort of um, is in balance in, uh, in other situations. Uh, but in general, the trajectory is a positive one and, and moving uh, forward. And what's wonderful is that um, we see that um, levels of satisfaction with life are very high among people in many developing countries, countries without all of the economic resources that mm -hmm. economically rich countries experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a very uh, important lesson. We, mm -hmm. we need to understand more what the drivers are, what, mm -hmm. what are the underlying dynamics that make that possible. Um, so some of our materialistic accoutrements don't seem necessary to a life of happiness or meaning? No. Uh, to me, it, it, what you say is, is correct. Um, I'm trying to remember the source of a series of photographs that I saw that you may have seen too, which showed different families and their possessions. And it was a, uh, not a trip, yeah, it was a triptych with three families oh, interesting. and showed everything that they owned mm -hmm. that was necessary to their life. And you had one family in a developing country and it was basically the family members, <laughs> the children, huh. and a pot and a few things. And then you got to a middle income country and it got to be a cottage type house with simple furniture and so on, uh, and maybe a little bit of land to, to grow uh, agricultural products. And then you got to um, people in highly advanced economic countries, and it was so crazy. <laughs> I mean, cars and cameras and computers and, you know, everything that one can imagine. And just the differences, the disparities in the mm -hmm. size of the piles mm -hmm. uh, of these uh, mm. three groups um, Amazing. Was, was just startling to look at. What was even more startling is if you picked away at the uh, pictures, particularly those of the developed world, the, the, rich, uh, the richest world, almost all of the products they had originated in the South. 
that is from the families that had the least. Uh -huh. So whether you're talking about coffee beans or steel or coal mm -hmm. or petroleum or whatever, mm -hmm. the, the rich depended on those with the least mm -hmm. in order to maintain their very high lifestyle. So um, it, it's now established, uh, it's now established that um, the rich of the world consume 80% of the world's total resources and the poor have access to only 20%. This despite the fact that the ratios, population ratios, are the reverse. 80% of the world's population is poor, consuming 20% of the world's resources, versus 20% rich, consuming 80% of the world's resources. But the fact that the resources come from the South, from the developing countries, is, uh, is really quite Quite intriguing. Well, thank you for a, a career dedicated towards documenting and redressing this inequality. You're very welcome. I thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Okay.